Hey there, everybody. Give me a shout out. Let me know if you can hear me. Hey, Telos, Ronnie, Matthew, Peruz, Riley. Great. Okay, guys. You should be seeing my ZBrush as well. Let me just get another confirmation um, on that one. Cool. Okay. Let's get so we can start drawing. So how are things going? How did the week go? There's uh, something administratively I want to chat with you guys about before we get started. I'm going to do this at the beginning of it. Um, but Beru says things are going well. Mark too quickly. Uh, Mark, yes, he's writing too quickly. Yeah, I can imagine. There is a lot in that beginning part. We're going to slow down a little bit and just start focusing on tools today um, and kind of a project. Uh, but I hope you're making use of the questions. I saw you guys were making use of the projects. That was great. I think that's actually almost a record. <laughs> More projects than we have people. And uh, that's, that's really, really awesome. So it looks like that feature is definitely something that you guys are enjoying. Uh, questions, as of, as of the time of me saying this, they have one tiny bug, which is not that, which is kind of uh, a problem when you're making multiple uh, responses. So that'll be fixed shortly. Um, but I see that's kind of helping as well. So now the next thing I wanted to talk with you guys about is, um, let me get in here. I'm going to close Lightbox by clicking the Lightbox button. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is that Thursday session. Okay, and um, uh, we've got, uh, we've got over half the class in in this session right now. So what I really want to know from you guys is if that Thursday class is really important um, or if we can come up with another method. And we'll we'll ask you guys this again. We'll ask you an email to get a bit more of your response. But basically we heard from some people that Thursday at 1 p.m. I think it's at 1 p.m. and uh, Saturday at uh, 3.30 you know it was really hard for Europeans. So um, it was really hard, plus also we heard some people say that being in a session for three hours is kind kind of mind-numbing. <laughs> no disrespect intended to my training, but I can understand, you know, three hours, one guy talking and showing, it's, that's, it's hard on the brain. So we have another proposal. And I just want you to give me a little chow, uh, shout out, uh, just a yes, no, and then I can kind of start to drill down. But basically, we're thinking about taking this Thursday 1 p.m., and we're going we're gonna to break that up into three sessions or more, depending on if you guys want it. And these are three sessions. Each session is one hour. Okay, so that's the first thing. We're going to break them up into three sessions. Each session is one hour. And that is, uh, uh, that'll allow us to do, say, one at 10 a.m., uh, another at 1 p.m., and then probably another at 10 a.m. Or, or something like that. So we're going to break it up. Uh, do you guys have any problems with going from three hours to, to one hour? Keep in mind, Saturday's marathon session will continue. But what we're talking about is Thursday. Does anybody, is anybody opposed to breaking up Thursday? Just give me a shout out. Okay. All right. So we've got just a few people that are uh, that want the longer session, but the bulk of everybody is really tending towards uh, separate blocks. So we're talking, I think that's probably almost a 90% at separate blocks. Okay, let me tell you, uh, there's another added aspect to this that might swing people over. So uh, each of these sessions, instead of going through GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar, we would use them through uh, Google Hangouts. 
So the advantage to Google Hangouts is not just, you know, it's a separate piece of software. The advantage to Google Hangouts is that we have about 10 people, including the, uh, the instructor, and everybody can share their screen. So what we're really talking about is uh, breakout sessions. That's what we're calling these. So now that I say it like that, let's say if we take that Thursday marathon lecture-based session, we break that up into three or four or five hangouts or breakout sessions, does that work for you? What do you think about breakout sessions? I'm just looking through this. All right, we're getting some mixed. I'd say we're still 50-50. I gotta uh, print this out and uh, and tally that up, and then of course we'll email you guys. Okay, so I'm going to clear the screen. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we could do a poll if you like. Uh, oh, you can do polls here. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. I'll I'll think about it. Poll sounds cool. I think it's a good idea. Okay. All right. So let me uh, let me summarize all of this, and then I can probably do a poll. So I'm going to clear this screen. And I'll tell you, this is what we're thinking about. There's the Saturday session. Okay, this has to stay at 3.30. That cannot change because of the schedule that we have with um, all of the artists. And, and Saturday is a busy day. So, for example, there's Chris Costa, then there's Peter Koenig. And so 3.30 is the only slot we have for that. Okay, and uh, that's lecture-based. So that's where I'm going to be going through uh, talking and answering questions that come up through the questions tab, but mostly me talking. These are pre-recorded. You do get the pre-recorded up. You know, we try to we put it up on Tuesday because our work days are um, Monday or Tuesday through Saturday, so we get it up Tuesday. And then on top of that, so you get Saturday plus you get a breakout session. Okay, and that's once a week with let's say eight other people and you can share your screen and you get uh, m greater access uh, really to the instructor to who's running it uh, for questions because you're not muted uh, you're in a smaller group so manage of that kind of thing is, a, is significantly easier. So we're talking Saturday exists, that re, that's recorded. Breakout session uh, will open up multiple sessions. If you need, if you want the lecture or the practicum, you come for the Saturday. And then you have the choice of whether or not you want to do a breakout session or not. It's really, really your choice. So now that I've done that, let me do a quick poll, and um, let me, uh, I have to clear the screen to get to the next stage. So let me see if I can write the poll quickly enough. I can do it for you right now, Ryan, if you like. I'm actually in here. Uh, I just, uh, I just stopped. Uh, no, actually, if you can do that, that'd be great, because that's a lot of filling out to do. <laughs> sure. This is second I just saw that. Yeah. Okay, he's going to pull that together. Let me just look through your questions right now, or your uh, comments. Um, I want morning and evening. Karen, yeah, we can do morning and evening. Rodrigo, Saturday is your only session, I understand. Georgie, a breakout session is a smaller group of us. So instead of the whole group being in one class, one monolithic lecture hall, you, uh, there's going to be a smaller group of 10 people that includes the lecturer uh, in a session. Um, everybody can share their screen or not share their screen. You can pop in and ask a question. You can head out if you want, if you need to head out. But it, it opens up accessi uh, 
it makes us much more accessible to you. Hope that answers your question, Georgie. If not, just let me know. Roberto likes it. Jose, okay. Wednesdays, yeah, we can do multiple days. Any afternoons better than Thursday? <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. Uh, always something. Keith is up for all kinds of stuff. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to launch the poll. All right, let's just take a second and uh, just answer that. Poll must be close to enable screen sharing. Okay. So you're looking at a poll right now. Uh, Karen, you're, ask, uh, you're asking about a name, so it's Kurt asking about a name change. Uh, can you email support with that? That way it will, it gets done independently of these sessions. Uh, you can also email Nate on that, but support's the best. Uh, oh, you need it changed in GoToWebinar, different system. Yes, uh, Nate will have to take care of that. Nate, you can see the questions from um, Kurt. He's coming in as Karen. Just needs to have the GoToWebinar changed if possible, or he has to have a new link with a new name uh, set up there with GoToWebinar. Uh, Mark, we'll have a registration. It's going to be real easy. It's just a self-registration. Uh, Hangouts are just a URL, so it, you access that URL at your time, and that's the end of the story. Now, since uh, you know we all know each other, uh, it's a pretty low-key um, event. We don't have a lot of randomness. We will uh, just send you guys the link, and you show up for the time that you can, the time that you're assigned, and then we go from there. Orla, what time zone are you in? That makes a difference for PM and AM. Alvaro, you probably have to have a Gmail account to access Hangouts. Probably, but I'm not certain. They are free, though. OK, guys, let's see. No opinion, breakout sessions, and one long session. So I don't know if you guys can see the the um, setup here, but we're looking at probably about an 86 to 85 to 15. Paul, uh, Saturday. Well, we want to have the breakouts during the week, but we there's no reason we can't do one on the weekend because it is a different system than go to uh, webinar. So Nate could literally be in a breakout before this class, but everything done and said, we're pretty packed on Saturdays. Saturdays should stay the same with the, um, with the long meeting. OK, just another minute, guys. I don't want to spend more than 15 minutes on this uh, stuff. I've got your notes for the time zone. And I think we have our numbers. So 91% uh, voted. We're waiting on that 9%, but that's not going to swing the, the move from one long Thursday. So all right, we'll be uh, in touch with you guys. I'll talk to Nate about this, and we will figure out which direction is really going to be, uh, uh, which possible directions are going to be the best. We'll email you guys. Uh, most likely what we'll do is we'll just open up a bunch of times, including that Thursday time. So the previous Thursday at 1 o'clock will be one of the choices. And for those who prefer one long session, they just come to that. Or if those who prefer that time, they come to that. It'll be a shorter session, but it'll still be uh, quite comprehensive. All right, any questions, guys? We're going to get into the instruction part. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and let me kind of jump in there with some administrative stuff. I'm kind of excited about the breakouts, too. 
because there's a lot that we can do with it. For example, if I'm running a, um, a Google Hangout, uh, we can all be sculpting one particular project, but uh, I can jump in and see what you're sculpting and how you're sculpting. I literally will see it at the bottom of my screen. So I can just jump in when I see somebody making a, uh, uh, a mistake or something really cool, and we can kind of do a little spot critique on the side, or we can also so, um, kind of, if you're having problems with the interface in some way, we can do a spot fix and go through that, as well as just talk about what really works for you. Hangouts are, you'll see, a lot of fun. All right, guys. So, let me get my computer and everything set up. Something's wrong here. Oh, that's coming from Wii down there. Okay, we don't need that. We need this. All right, you should see my ZBrush, and I'm going to load a uh, polysphere. Good Lord. We're in uh, Cable Evan here. Got a million. Oh, it's these new, new hard drives. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm going to go into Lightbox. I'm going to load in uh, Default Sphere. I'm not saving that. And uh, we we should have sculpted a bunch of heads. Okay, that's the first project, and I saw from the projects area of the course, people were going and building heads like gangbusters. So this is this is really great. Um, and in this case, we really wanted to get a sense of just the brushes uh, and the, just the act of sculpting. The act of kind of pushing and pulling is really the goal here. It was the goal last week. How does the clay buildup brush work? How does smooth work? How do all of these things work? And how do you make them work to get the form that you want? You know, so that you're getting the particular uh, cavity of the eye with the uh, with the angle that you want for it. You're getting a little bump for the lips and uh, all of these things. Okay, some of us are uh, have studied anatomy and are more fluent in the forms of the face. Some of us are more fluent in the design aspects of the face. And I can give you a, a really good example of some of that stuff. Like I understand the anatomy of the face uh, very well and I still know a lot of the names. Uh, I don't think knowing the names are essential, but I understand the face very well, and, and uh, I can talk to you know, surgeons about it and things of that nature. Uh, but I don't necessarily have a, a st super strong design language to characters and characters' faces. Somebody like Danny Williams, you know, he has a, just an amazing grasp on anatomy, but that's not his priority. His grasp on the anatomy of the face is really only designed to help him get a sense of character and design. I'll take it too far and get into anatomy. He takes it into the character realm. And, uh, and that's a totally different skill. So all of that stuff has to be learned. And then some of us are just learning anatomy and design all at the same time. So uh, it was really cool to see everybody's face faces and I think um, we've got uh, some good exposure on how to do that. If you have problems with sculpting the bra with sculpting any form, you definitely want to check in with us and let us know uh, what's going on and we can help uh, and see if we can recommend something. Maybe you're, it's a usage issue you're going through. Now what we need to do is we need to go to the next level. You are sculpting a face. Now let's get in and see what happens if we start to sculpt. In this case, we're going to sculpt a body. But this could be anything. This could be us getting in and sculpting uh, you know, a prop, uh, a scene, some kind of environmental piece. You know, there's a lot of options for it. We're going to sculpt the body in this particular case. And what we want to look for, what we really want to make sure we understand today is how to deal with measurements inside of ZBrush. OK, 
okay, measurements and proportion. Uh, we want to look at what I call the maquette approach. If you've seen the videos that were unlocked on Tuesday, then you've already seen this maquette approach, which uses the insert sphere brush a lot. I'm going to do this differently than the videos, though. In the videos, we created a default figure, and uh, and it was in a T pose. All right, but I got a lot. Of, I got some questions from people. You know, do we create things in a T pose? And for those who don't know what T pose is, a T pose is when your model is just standing there with his arms out. Do you always sculpt your figure like that? Always, always, always? No, you don't. So I want to give a kind of, in this practicum today, I want to twist this around. You don't need to sculpt your figure like this all the time. Uh, a lot of people will say this, let's say if you're in the toy industry, do you sculpt your model in a T pose and then pose it? Uh, you can, but why not just sculpt it in pose? Okay. Well, there's some reasons why not. What are the problems with sculpting in a pose? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Unsure of proportions. You lose symmetry. Uh, difficult to rig. Absolutely. Israel, if you're going to rig, you don't want to sculpt uh, in asymmetry or in pose. Muscles, production, rigging. You know, these are all technical issues, yes. But before you even get to rigging and muscles and production, there is another very large problem <laughs> with sculpting in pose. And uh, uh, John got it by saying unsure of proportions. When you sculpt the model in pose, number one, you don't have symmetry, and number two, you have to see through form. So you have to be able to look at that rib cage from any angle and know what's the curvature of that angle. You know, where does it fit into a box? Where does the pelvis fit into a box? You know, you have to be able to see those things in your mind's eye, which is complicated, very complicated. So that'll take us back to the measurements, and it'll give me a chance to talk about um, human proportions. Now, I'm not in the anatomy class. We go step by step through that, um, but in this case, what I'm going to do is kind of apply it, and so I'll say these measurements on the fly and then I'll use a particular tool, in this case what we call transpose, to do the measurements as well. All right, so the maquette sculpting, we're going to do it in pose. So I've got to figure out a pose, and I'll admit I don't have one in my mind right now. It's usually a mild warning sign. <laughs> and then the other problem with sculpting in pose is that you have to select parts of the model, and you have to deal with uh, what we call polygroups slightly differently. So you want polygroups because groups are a way to uh, um, select parts of the model. They're like a selection set if you're Maya talk. If you're um, in something else, they just allow you to group the arms from the legs. Okay, we're going to talk a bit about Dynamesh. And we're going to talk about subtools. Okay, when do you use subtools? When not? I highly recommend you look through the lectures uh, for a really detailed explanation for what subtools are. And to pass the test, you need to know one thing about subtools. One really important thing, and I'm going to tell it to you right now, in the form of a question. Uh, and this is primarily for the Maya people. Uh, are subtools designed to be like Maya's outliner? Okay, that's one question. Let me ask that. Anybody want to give an answer? Now, I'm, also, I'm going to give you a cheat sheet on this. About 99.9% .9 of the time that I ask you a question that involves ZBrush trying to be like another application? The answer is no. <laughs> there is massive phobia 
to being like other applications. All right, there's a reason for it, and you know, there's some downsides to it, but there is a reason for it, and the, the reason is that they're trying to find a new language uh, in terms of coding and in terms of you and I sculpting. For example, DynaMesh. Some people will say, you know, I wish ZBrush was more like Photoshop, I wish ZBrush was more like Maya. And I tell you, you, sh you do not want to wish that. Never wish that ZBrush was more like Photoshop. Because if ZBrush was more like Photoshop, you would not have DynaMesh, guaranteed hands down. If it was more like Maya, you would not have DynaMesh, hands down, you would not have it. You would not have ZRemesher, all right? Not at all, not even for a second, it would not exist. I was talking to one of the uh, Photoshop guys and, um, during some, at some convention, and he was talking about how changes to the lasso took them three months to code. Three months to code for some simple changes to the lasso. So do you think they're going to be introducing brand new awesome features? Well, you know, all you got to do is look at the pace of feature development. And you can see, Pixelogic is, is basically going crazy. DynaMesh, ZRemesher, they release things in point updates for free that other software companies would basically delay year, a year just to get it into the 2014 version. So uh, I know that's a lot of marketing talk and a lot of hype, but it, it, it's really actually fairly significant because uh, ZBrush is this kind of luxury application. It exists out there in a world of a bunch of other applications. And almost all single applications have been either bought out or they have grouped together to do their own thing. Uh, you can see the foundry with Nuke and Mari and, um, and Modo. It's a big group, great guys, really awesome software. You can see Autodesk bought all three of the major hubs, Maya, Max XSI. So uh, for ZBrush to be out there like they are, that's massive exposure in terms of their business and their business model. But it's also this unique opportunity for somebody to just keep fighting, fighting to make a difference in our world, which is pretty awesome. So. <laughs> Roberta. All right, so d features like DynaMesh are real important. Uh, th they're like signature things, okay? Uh, but if we get back to the conversation about subtools, subtools have a reason to exist. And that reason has a goal, it has a root in one artist's experience. So make sure you check out the lectures and you look for the explanation about Chris Costa and, um, and his work. Uh, and what uh, what he was trying to do with a dragon. There's a, a explanation there that shows and explains why subtools uh, are around. And really, the long, the short answer is it's so you get more polygons. So all right, that's what we're going to deal with today. So let's jump in first to measurements and set our stage so that we've got a world in ZBrush where we can start to work with an eight head proportioned model. Okay, So I'm going to give you the explanation, I'm going to give you the eight head proportion and you can Google this, it's not, this isn't magic knowledge, it was magic knowledge 50 years ago, now it's everything's, all of this stuff is Googleable. Uh, so we're going to work with eight heads. The first thing that we need to do is go to the floor onto the right of the screen and if you if you go towards the top, you see this little thing that's shaped like a Y. I'm going to just click that Y a couple of times. I'm going to turn it on and off, on and off. I don't want the Y. What I want is either the X or the Z. And notice how I accidentally turned it off. This can be a little tricky. So you want the floor button to be orange and you want that Z to be active. And if that's the case, then you'll see a, a grid right behind you. 
Yeah, that Y is very tiny. So now if somebody can tell me where did they move this? They moved the um, the grid lightning that somewhere. Can you guys hear me okay? It just uh, gave me a minor warning. Okay, we'll let that one worry. Draw palette. This is really not the one that's going to do that. My P frame's not working. Okay. Well, we don't need to do that. What I'm going to do right now is do my other option. I'm going to go into document and click this back. And I'm going to just kind of see if I can find a, a something that's going to show it for you. Let's see where she's so geared towards dark. Let's go here. Okay, and I'm going to switch over to matte cap gray. Ooh, never mind. Stay in skin. I'm going to change that color. I did a couple of things that are a little bit, you know, not normal. I changed the background, changed the color of the material. So if those, if you get lost there, don't do it. Stop right away. Don't do that at all. Okay, just reading through the questions. Now, let's take a look at what we see here. We see uh, one box, two box, three box, four box, five box, six box, and on and on and on and on. What we want to do right now is get a little bit more control over these boxes. And the reason why is because this one square here is taking up, what, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we want one of these boxes to represent one head unit. So I think it's a little bit much to ask us to take this tiny sphere, this big sphere, sorry, and convert it down into one of these tiny boxes. So I'm going to come up over here into the draw palette. I'm going to make some adjustments there. Let me come into draw. I'm also going to throw this over into the side. So I'm grabbing this little swatch icon, throwing it over to the side. And what we're looking at right now are the grid size and the tiles. That's going to be the primary thing that we're uh, looking to adjust at this point. I'm going to set the grid size to 4. Let's turn perspective off, too. Notice how the perspective, uh, you can see here, the camera would have been looking kind of from this view. And you can see the grid is behind. It's behind that um, sphere. So perspective would work to distort that grid as well. So in this particular case, when we're starting out, we do not want perspective on. Otherwise, we're not going to get true grid uh, relationship. All right, so what we're looking at right now is we have one, two, three, four, roughly, okay? So the grid size of four, we've got that sphere representing roughly four, and we've got the tiles set to seven, and I'm gonna set this to eight, okay? When I set this to eight, something magical happens here. This thing lines up. So this is where I'm gonna give you a little bit of magical information about ZBrush. First off, you have to know that ZBrush is absolutely 100% a benevolent dictatorship. Think Cuba, but, but no problems. So maybe, uh, maybe like, um, think Smurfs, right? There's, a, there's one guy makes the decisions, Papa Smurf, everybody has to follow along. It's a benevolent dictatorship. When you're inside of ZBrush, ZBrush is controlling a lot of things. Okay, a lot. Thanks, John, for that, uh, for that pointer. Uh, it's controlling the size of the model 
within the ZBrush world. And we can see hints of that in the geometry size. Okay, you can see some adjustments to size happening here. And you can also see in geometry export, you see a scale factor here as well. We don't need to get into that and understand it just now. But what I want to press upon you, the important thing that I want to press upon you is that uh, when you're inside of ZBrush, uh, you are dealing with one ZBrush unit as a standard of measurement. Okay? And you won't necessarily know what one ZBrush unit is. It's just an arbitrary mathematical uh, unit. Let's assume that one ZBrush unit equals one centimeter in real space. Okay? That would be really good knowledge if it wasn't for one very important factor. On import, okay, whenever you bring a model into ZBrush, it performs several actions. One of them is that it scales your model to one ZBrush unit. Okay. Every model that gets imported into ZBrush gets scaled at, to one ZBrush unit. That's the end of that story. It's always that way. ZBrush does not have real-world coordinates. You can certainly line objects up. There's, a, there's a, a very simple mechanism for that. All you have to do is you make them subtools of each other, and then they'll automatically line up like they do in real world. But in this particular instance, we're dealing with the isolated object and it has been scaled to one ZBrush unit. That's the long uh, and the short of that. What happens if we come over here and we set the grid size to, let's say, 1? Or if we set it to 16? Let's play with that, see if we can make any difference. But keep in mind that when you're in ZBrush, your, mo your model has been scaled. And it, its size has been adjusted. Anybody want to take a guess at why ZBrush does this? Let me switch over to red for you guys. John's saying it's a little hard to see. Why would ZBrush scale everything to one ZBrush unit? Maya units, max units are different? Well, not necessarily. Uh, John, so it can handle polys differently, more efficient. Michael, algorithms and mac mathematics. Riley, computational precision, which is actually what the other guys were also mentioning. Computational precision will also solve Matthew's note of performance issues and Michael's algorithms and mathematics and uh, John, John's note that it makes it more efficient. So uh, before, in ZBrush 2 days, uh, ZBrush did not have floating point math inside the application. It has it now, but back then it did not have floating point math because floating point math was more expensive. To, in today's computers, it's the uh, computational difference between 16-bit math and floating-point math is, is, you know, it's not an issue. It, it, in nowhere near the issue it was when ZBrush 2 was around, and we had the computers we had 10 years ago, right? Anybody remember how fast those computers worked? Or that sound of AOL signing up <laughs> to get onto the internet for 30 seconds, one minute? So. Um, in the older ZBrush, they didn't have floating point math, which mean, meant you had to control the size of your model or your mathematical calculations would just go through the roof. Now, Maya has you know, floating point math and they've had it from the beginning, but everybody knows that as soon as you get, a, you know, it used to be if you get a model that has 100,000 polygons into a program like Maya, just 100,000 polygons, and Maya would have just not it would not have behaved. It, it would have, in my, it, I had several crashes and, you know, things just didn't work very well. And that's a performance issue. 
which has to do with the efficiency of their algorithm, which has to do with how they're, compu how they're computing and how accurate they're getting. And the more accurate they get, the larger those numbers get in a floating point, in floating point math, and the more complicated things get. So, long story short, and this is really important, guys, because this, this introduces you to this, um, this gulf, like ZBrush 2, we, we still are dealing with some of the ramifications of the slow computer ZBrush 2 dealt with. Uh, for example, ZBrush doesn't use more than four gigabytes of RAM because it's not a floating point. It's not a, sorry, it's not a 64-bit um, uh, app. It's not a 64-bit app because a lot of the computations that they wrote in the early days just make it kind of expensive to port it all over because a, a lot of that stuff has, is custom developed. ZBrush is more custom developed than you would, than you would ever know. It's insanely customized. The uh, head of development actually codes some of this stuff in machine language. Imagine that, right? Not even C++. In order to get efficiency, they're doing it in, in machine language. It's insane. They're getting to the fastest, fastest, fastest possible route. Okay, let me look through the here. Uh, Behrouz is asking a good question about GPUs, which I think is important before we get off this ZBrush unit. Um, GPUs can bring up the idea of OpenGL, and, uh, and I can tell you it's, it's actually real simple. Who's going to win, Intel or NVIDIA? Who do you have your money on in the long-term race for processors? Because GPU or CPU, you know, they're just processing units. Who's winning, NVIDIA or Intel? I see some NVIDIA, but I'm not seeing that in the real world. Because it has to be comp it has to not just be computationally sound for graphics cards. Okay, it has to be s computationally sound for everything. What's the fastest way to do something? Well, right now it's your CPU. N you know, by and large, unless of course you have a GPU that's insanely expensive. You know, and then and you're dealing with a CPU which is not insanely expensive. So you have to average these out, of course. But a GPU, number one, carries a heavy load of, you have to have OpenGL, you have to have a whole bunch of, uh, you, you put some of the burden on the user to have the proper system. Who's installed some of these applications like Maya Max or Moto or any of these other guys and ran into OpenGL issues? Or their system wasn't supported? Well, ZBrush is really for the masses. It's really for everybody. It's really for anybody. So ultimately, it needed to be a sound application for any computer, which meant instantly, right off the bat, GPU was out the door because GPU is only in a very specific select group of people and not accessible to everybody. And not, I mean, even installing video cards is a, is a difficulty for some people. So that would make it an out. So they relied on CPU, and in relying on CPU, they bet on Intel. Now, you know, I understand. Intel, you know, they, they had some competition there for a while with NVIDIA and with graphics cards. But still, by and large, that's where, um, that's where the power is. And especially as soon as they went into hyper-threading and they started doing multi-core uh, processors. So if you're able to get um, an eight-core or six, a four-core uh, processor, quad-core, that's your best bet. Get your quad-core, make sure it's hyper-threaded, and ZBrush will simply fly. All right, looking through the notes. Hey, Wayne, they are available. Yes, later. Uh, uh, Wayne is mentioning the i7-8 core. Yeah, that, uh, it's expensive, but that's the way to go. Hey, have you seen the new, or the upcoming uh, Mac Pro? Mac, I forget what they're calling it, but that 
crazy cylindrical beast that they're building, 12 core, I mean, insane, and uh, lots of RAM helps. The Dyson, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. All right, guys. So uh, that, that took us aside a little bit, but it's actually really important information. Um, ZBrush uses your CPU. It uses your RAM. It uses your CPU because that's the long-term bet that Intel is going to beat everybody in the long term. And in terms of RAM, it's going to use an entire four gigs. So if your machine has eight, then all the other apps will get four gigs and ZBrush can have its own four gigs. Okay, you can see some of what ZBrush is doing up here. You see the free memory and the scratch disk in the active memory. You can see some of what it's doing there. So you can keep track there if you're kind of techno-minded about this and you want to know how much it's using and, and when it goes up. And Wayne, uh, just to reiterate, uh, ZBrush does only use four. And that's, it, it, it's a little less than four if I remember right. But that's because it's a 32-bit application. So that's a limitation of 32-bit apps. Um, when they make a 64-bit version or 64-bit, uh, you know, extension in some capacity, then uh, it'll use more somehow or another. But like I said, the problem with ZBrush going into a 64-bit app is it, you literally have to retool the entire car factory to get another car. It's not just, hey, let's make another car. It's, you know, you got to go to another city, build another factory with brand new tools, brand new processes, because ZBrush is one custom-coded piece of beauty, which is why it did what it did long before anybody else could even think about it. I mean, nobody did what ZBrush did uh, in, what, eight years ago. All righty. So we talked about one ZBrush unit. And what we are doing right now is trying to establish just some sculptural reference, some units for us to work with. So let's see, if I set the size down, grid size, let's leave it at four. But let's set the tiles to four. Or let's set the tiles to two. I like four. You know, that actually kind of works. It looks like if you set the tiles Well, no, I think two worked. Yeah, here we go. Can we set that to two? No, let's set it to four. Okay, we're gonna have to set it a little larger, but we're getting there. So I've got grid size of four, I've got tiles of two, and it looks like we've been able to scale that sphere fairly easily to fit here. So. Just a little tricky, little happy accident there. But I need to scale my size because I only have one, two, three, four. So let's scale that back to eight. And then you notice this changes everything, right? The grid size and the tiles, they're no longer the same size. So you have to kind of divide these by each other and adjust. So if I double up grid size, you know, I got to think about things from there. So we need more tiles. Let's go four. And there we go. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it's the same size. So we doubled grid and we doubled tiles. And we're in good shape. So now I've got my head here. And I'm ready to move this and adjust it into place. So now to move this, I have to introduce a new feature. So before I do that, let me just look in and see if anybody's in question. So Steve got it in advance. It's definitely an eight and a four. Um, and T laws, I'm not sure. Okay, cool. Alrighty. So I'm going to introduce you now. We're going to move from over here to here to the top, to the shelf, as we call it. And we're going to get into transpose. And we had one technical discussion already, but we're begging another technical discussion with transpose. Because some of you guys might think, like I did, 
what the hell is transpose? <laughs> why, why do we have tra what? Okay, and when you see it, if you use 3D applications before, you'll see that transpose is very similar to a gyro, but it's not. It is not a gyro. And so we talked earlier about how Pixelogic has a phobia of doing things the way other applications do things. And that extends all the way to this gyro. They saw this gyro as basically 1950s uh, you know, footwear that they didn't want to step in at all. They just did not want to get themselves into that. And they wanted to find the, uh, the next best thing. Because any effort they put towards the next best thing is generally going to give them better results than copying something somebody else already did. You know, so it's just you know I'm not going to say plus minus. I'm just going to give you a sense of their mindset. Now transpose. I got some math people here. I'm going to get one more techie side thing out. What the heck does transpose mean? What does transpose mean? Why would they call it? Because as soon as they said, yeah, we're going to have this tool, I looked at it, I was like, man, why can't you guys just make a gyro, please? And I bugged them for months, just make a gyro. I'm hearing this in every class, in every place I go, everybody wants a gyro. And uh, then I come in one day and I get this, like, it's, it's like a three-piece staff. It's like a um, totally different tool. And, uh, and they called it transpose, and I'm like, what the heck does transpose mean? Michael says, across position, Beharu's vector multiply. Uh, Jose, it's transposing the x, y, z coordinates of the vertices into a new one. Yeah, that's all it does. It's transpose means that you take, you take one bucket of math, and you just transpose it into another bucket of math. You know, however you want to simplify that, it's just taking one set of one set of data and putting it into another location. You're transposing. So, technically speaking, they were dead right. So you go into move, and if we zoom in, you'll see it a little better because we're we're working with a pretty large scale here. Do you see one, two? Three. All right, and these are really important. This center one, and we're only talking about move right now. The center one moves all. Everything else skews. I'm going to demonstrate that right now. I'm going to grab this outside. You see where I'm, I move my cursor so that it's inside, and then I skew it. Undo. Okay, this one does something totally different. It's, it's this really cool trimming function they have. But in this case, we want to focus on this middle one. We're just taking the middle dot. And moving it off to the side. But in, in, in our case, we want to zoom out. I'm going to just click and drag up. And then I'm going to press shift. Okay, so I click and drag up, press shift. You can also click these little orange dots, the orange circle, or you move inside, you get the red one. If you're working with the red, then you're skewing it. But if you're not, then you're repositioning it. You can see it snaps. Snap. Snap. There you go. Select the center white dot. Okay, and you can see if I if I click and move out, then I start to stretch this guy. So I don't want to do that. What I want to do is click plus shift to constrain it. Can everybody see the uh, text? Does it show up okay with the red? Is that better than the green? Good. Okay. And uh, yeah, Matthew's got some cool points in there. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I just clicked outside, I dragged it up. I'm going to press shift, click that white dot, and move that all the way up to the top. There we go. We've got our head. We're going to then be able to put our rib cage in, and then our hips, 
and then our knees, and then everything is going to flow from there. And we're going to get a full character while learning all of this cool stuff <laughs> about how ZBrush thinks. Riley's asking, is there a way to reset the position orientation? Is there a way to reset? Yes, let me show you that. So let me undo this. Well, I don't need to. Well, let's undo. Well, transpose is not going to reset. I understand what you're saying. Uh, Riley, there's not a way to reset. You have to click and draw out. You can also just click at the center, but notice that that moves along the normal. So if I click here, it'll change its orientation. So I'm snapping to the front view, I rotate and press shift. And I can redraw this out, I can even move it by selecting this, this red zone, which I should have made green. But if you move the bar itself, then it'll move all of them independently. It's going to take a little bit to get used to, but you will. And what I want to do is I'm going to move this down to be the rib cage. So I'm going to put this right there. I'm going to move that down, sorry. I'm going to put it right here. I'm moving it from where it was, which is right at the halfway mark, and I'm moving it up there. Okay, and let's start talking proportions. So everybody know the eight head proportional system? You know, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, real simple, the landmarks are, we've got the chin, Okay, you've got the um, the pubic symphysis. Okay, you've got the knee and the foot. So our head. Okay, and then in this area things get tricky. So let me see if I can do a breakdown. Let's do a breakdown over here. Well, that's not going to work. Let's just zoom in here in a moment. I've got my head. The neck is going to be like, let's say, one half of that head. Okay, one half of that head is pretty long for a neck. Do this with the um, your loved ones, your friends. Just to come up to them with like a uh, pencil or look at them from a distance, and you measure how much how much the pit of their neck is to their chin, and then how, if does that go all the way to where their eyes are? Or does it go a little bit below the eyes? My bet is you're going to find that half a head is really one of the longest necks you're going to see. So we put a little note there at about half a head, but we actually go a little bit higher than that. But it's, it's impossible for your brain to say, well, that's 7, or that's, a, yeah, let's say that's 7 sixteenths. You're not going to do that. When we talk about proportions, you're always going to work in halves, thirds, and fourths, and most of the time you're going to work in halves and then halves of halves. So you just work in halves. It just makes life easier. And if you, you can train your eye to get to the point where you can see halves and thirds, that's a, that's a major step. So the neck is going to be roughly that, and I'm just going to pull straight down, and then I'm going to pull straight out. So we've got one head width. That's where the shoulders are going to, they're going to be slightly inside of that. Okay, that's where you're going to get the acromion process. Okay. Before we go further, let's get the rib cage. So the rib cage, it's just for the sake of argument, say we're going to start where the pit of that neck is. And then let's move down one. So there's one head. And then there's roughly two heads. 
The rib, let's just say it's about 1.75 heads long. Let's just say that. So that means that I'm going to take this one head measurement I have here, and I'm going to divide that into half. Okay, so that becomes 1.5, and I divide that in half, and it becomes 1.75. So the rib cage is going to come out, and how wide is that rib cage going to be? Well, we have our measurement for one right here, right? But I think the head is going to be a little bit more, about 1.25 or something like that. So we're going to really bulk that up. And then we're going to get the, the rib cage, the, the, uh, what they call the um, Arch of Apollo. Okay, Arch of Apollo is going to come somewhere around here. Remember, your nipples are going to be right at the two-head mark. So these are nipples. Okay, and then we're going to get our pelvis. And then the pelvis does this really interesting thing. The hip, in and of itself, is it's roughly... I'm just drawing you a side view right now. Okay, and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to draw you a front view. I hope this schematic quality makes sense for you guys. But you can see that the this is called the um, anterior superior iliac spine, and that's called the symphysis pubis. That's at one third, one third, or you could say two thirds, however you want to measure that. But the male hip. Uh, largely fits within one head. Largely. You know, it's actually a little bit outside of that. It's really one head from one anterior superior iliac spine to another anterior superior iliac spine. But anatomy could not be made that easy for, for you. If it was, well, you know, anybody could be an artist. So, <laughs> This entire box that you see here, it's sunk down. So it's actually a box that starts a little bit below the pubic symphysis, because you can see the pubic symphysis is at one third. So we have to go down like that and like that. So that's my hip box. And then we just fit our bowl of Apollo, and then you got those wings from your, um, from your uh, ilium there, and there you go. If anybody wants to know more about this, you've got to look for Gottfried Bamas, or yeah, somebody who's a German can help me with that and the pronunciation. Uh, you get his book, Construction of Man, or if I remember right, it is uh, Die... Mensch, somebody who's going to get it to me right now, I think, uh, something about the machine. So, the machine of the body is the loose translation. All right, let's come out. We're going to go, this is the great trochanter, great trochanter. And then this comes down to the femur. Right. I'm just going to take the femur right down. And then I'm going to take the tibia. I'm going to take that right down. Okay. So we've got some simple measurements set up. The one thing to know is that the knee is kind of like it's half a head by half a head cube. And that cube largely sits. Well, don't do that, Ryan. Make it symmetrical. That cube largely sits on, it sits two heads above the ground. So this cube is real simple. Okay, It's really just the condyles of the femur, and then the head of the tibia. In the line of the tibia. This line of the tibia you can see in Leonardo da Vinci drawings. And then that comes down to an ankle 
and then the ankle is like about half a head. So we're going to go half a head, that's going to be mostly foot, or, or a third. Come up here to our arms. We're going to put the femur, the, the femur, the humerus is roughly one and a half heads. And then the forearm is one and two quarters heads. And then the arm, or the hand. Unless you're me, or somebody like me, and basically your, your arms will actually go down almost to your knees. So my fingers come right there, which is not a ringing endorsement of my charm. Uh, it's very ape-like, but <laughs> that's my arm. I can almost touch my patella in a perfectly straight uh, pose. If I bend just the tiniest bit, I can touch my patella. All right, so I've got a little simian left in me. Don't hold it against me. I'm just like you, I promise. And there you go. So let's break that down and so we can get to work. Uh, we haven't even got into using this program. I just, I'm giving you technical information from ZBrush and then over here. And we're what, an hour into this. So let me, I'm gonna kill the screen and I'm gonna summarize all of this again. Okay. So one head, we've got a rib cage in here. We've got a pelvis in here. We've got a femur that comes down to the knee. Okay, and then we've got the foot. Use these circles when you do this stuff yourself. These circles are actually highly advanced measurement systems developed in the Renaissance. <laughs> I'm joking, uh, only par partly there. Uh, these constructions, dots, um, help you with what's called constellation drawing. You can see that in Ray Bustos, he does a bit on constellation drawing, and Marshall Vandriff is one of the people that's really promoted it, and I think uh, Wayne has brought up Riven Phoenix, the structure of man, uh, that talks about that, I assume. And uh, so these little dots, really important uh, to helping us, and they're very fast, it's very gestural. Okay, let's do this from a side view. Boom, rib cage pelvis, leg, tibia, foot. Notice the tilting. That's how the, my instructors always said, think of it as tilting. This tilts forward, that tilts backwards. I, I get lost with that day in and day out. But basically we have head is straight up and down, rib cage is orientated one direction, and then the pelvis is orientated the other, and, and that's relevant because if you're going to do this right, you're going to need the small of the back. And if you ever are looking at your work, just look at the small of the back. Look for that to see if it's really working for you. This is a real important part. If you're sculpting a female, you've got to get that small of the back. You've got to get that because it really sets up what happens in the buttocks and then it sets up what happens here. In the, in the rib cage. If you're uh, sculpting a male, it's a little less important, but you still need to sculpt that musculature, the, let's say the erector spinium muscle, all that stuff back in there. So anyways, there we go. We have our proportional system. I am going to put, I'm putting the, um, the ball at the center. So my plan is I'm going to move, I'm going to use move brush and move it up. I'm going to show you my maquette process. I'm going to add a hip I'm going to add a head, okay, and then we're going to add legs and just get this thing going. We'll probably actually add a shoulder in here as well, and then we'll probably add a gluteus. We'll add a butt, basically, because it is its own entity, and it's a nice, pretty butterfly if you do it right. All right, looking at questions here. I'll let uh, Nate answer that if he can. Okay, no questions. All right, now we're gonna talk maquette process. Okay, 
the maquette process uses one thing very specifically if it opens it uses this guy right here I'm gonna hover my cursor it says insert sphere we use that insert sphere I have it assigned to a hotkey the hotkey number one and you can see because right next to the word insert sphere it has the number one which means that you know that's my hotkey uh, and um, you know we can go into clay build up to see the other one where did I put my pin yeah clay build up is five clay is three move is two so I'm gonna tell you when I do this but um, I'm gonna start using the hotkeys so I'm gonna go into move then I'm gonna go into insert sphere the key to this is that you have no subdivision levels, but don't worry, ZBrush is going to give me the warning that I need to set me on the right track, so I'm not terribly, uh, I'm not sweating it. Okay. First thing we need to do, pull that rib cage up. So it's kind of close to that halfway point where the neck starts, remember, and then the head is in here, and then we get the shoulders, and then we get these massive muscles, and, you know, this guy comes in, these really big arm, a really big forearm, and he's, yeah. And this, these, this is me after weightlifting with really long forearms, and the little skinny little legs in there. Okay. So we're going to gesturally do... <laughs> This kind of thing. This is I, this is sketched out to give you a sense of we want to be loose. Okay. So move brush. Symmetry is on. I'm just going to pull that up and pull it down. And what do I need to do from a side view? Uh, I showed you. Let me just get some audience participation. I got to rotate it. I got to skew it. Tilt it back, Matthew says. So yeah, you could go into rotate, and you could drag this out, and you could say, oh, I'm going to rotate that back. You could totally do that. But that does the same thing. Just click with the move brush and pull it back, and just make sure your brush size is kind of large. And it's very fast and very easy. Cool. Now, I'm going to enlarge that a little bit, because we're working on a male at this point, I think. So a male is going to have roughly, let's say, 1.25. Some of that can coincide with the lats. So, but let's go about 1.25. Also, the uh, bulk of the ribs are going to be kind of right down towards the bottom with that eighth, ninth. You know, that's where things are going to get really kind of just beefy. So the angle we're pulling out towards the bottom. Okay, I'm going to press 1, which is going to get me into the insert sphere. I look at this from the top. Okay, and it gives me my, my warning. It says, it says, delete your subdivision levels if you want to continue. So I'm going to grab this swatch and throw it inside, which gets rid of it. I'm going to delete lower. Okay, and then I'm going to click up here at the top again. And that's actually the neck. So I'll switch from 1 to 2, that's my hotkey, and then I pull these guys. You see how I, there's this back and forth. I pulled down, pulled up, I pulled down, I pulled up. I did that because I really don't like to change my draw size. Changing my draw size means I have to stop my brain and think about something. I would prefer to spend 5 <laughs> minutes, well not 5 minutes, I'd prefer to spend 45 seconds bouncing back and forth like this until that thing got bigger than I would spend 10 seconds and change the draw size. That's my brain, that's the way I work, and you'll find the way that works for you. There's no good answer there. There's no real answer. It's just, hey, what do you like? But in my case, using the uh, draw size interrupts my flow. I press insert sphere, I'm gonna drag that out, and I'm gonna try to drag it out to fit one head. I overdid it, not a big deal you'll see that this is masked out. So that's masked. That's not masked. That's really important to kind of keep in mind. That's how this maquette process works. So I'm going to drag it up. I'm going to let my cursor, oops, oh, switch over to the move brush, Ryan. Move that up. 
move that up. Perspective is not on, so this is really easy, actually. And then, anybody know what the width of the head is? Anybody want to tell everybody else? So we know we have one head tall. How wide should a head be? It should be half, 0.75. George, you got it first, then Beirut's. 0.75. In this case, I'm increasing my draw size. And I rotate it. See, I've, I've kind of rotated this around just a little bit. And I like that because then I'm not looking at it straight on. It's like I'm looking at it from a slight distance. So if it was a cube, it would now be kind of in this position. And that means I'm able to see more of the side view when I push it in. Just tiny thing makes my life easier. And how do you know it's 0.75 heads? I'm going to give you a technical explanation. I'm going to give you a tool that will tell you exactly 0.75. But if you didn't have that tool, how would you know? Of course, you've got this grid here. What tool can I use, not in ZBrush, to transpose, to use our newly learned term, over here and automatically give me something that says 0.75. Use a ruler. Use your fingers. Use the pen. That's exactly right. I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to set my pen down at about 0.75. And I'm going to take my measurement. And I've got just a little bit to crop it off. Does anybody here draw on their screen? I used to until I got a Cintiq. And then I'm still too scared. But I used to draw on it all the time. I'm going to pull this in. I'm going to pull that up. And this whole thing needs to be moved forward. And I don't want to really use transpose just yet. But I should. I think I'm going to drag that out. Press shift and move that forward a little bit. OK. Control, click and drag clears the mask. And I just want to adjust that neck a little bit. And I'm going to pull up the shoulders. Because one of the things you've got to learn about the neck, or the rib cage, I should say, is that it is lower in the front, higher in the back. Pit of the neck, and then this goes to the seventh cervical vertebrae. Okay, let's not mess with that too much right now. Let's switch back over to insert sphere. And this is going to be the tummy. Let them merge so I don't have multiple. So I'll switch over into the move brush. And I'm going to do the same thing back and forth. And what that does is it really, like I'll pull back and forth until this thing is a stretched out piece. And then I'll grab this stuff move it up, and it quite naturally, sorry, I'm using a brush you guys have already told me you don't like, or color I mean, and, and flatten that. It's very simple. Don't have to mess with a lot. And not only that, but since we're doing a maquette, you know, and I'm showing you guys the T-square pose, the T-pose. I'm going to have to show you the not T-pose. But there was too much to do, so... Let's get them a little bit of chunk. Okay. And then from the back view, I'm going to come to Insert Sphere. And I'm going to try to make that one head. I'm going to just check. Yeah, I'm using my fingers. It's about one head. You know, I've got to pull down on the sides. to create more of a box. But that's kind of the long and the short of it. OK. 
keep it below the halfway point. And kind of keep it lined up with the ribs. Don't let that stomach fool you. So that stomach doesn't, it's not filling up this back area like it should. Okay, and let's repeat, insert sphere. We're gonna put legs in. Now I switch over, instead of using move, I wanna show you a couple of options. We can use snake hook. Which is kinda neat. Has some potential. You know, it doesn't look very pretty from here, but I mean, it doesn't take that much. Voila. Looks like tentacles, and now it's not too bad. And it has some of that curve. It's got front to back, and it pulled it in. So we look at a side view, and whatever that curve, whatever curve's not there, we'll have to readjust it. Okay. Cool and clear that. We've got a basic rough mesh that's one way using snake hook. Now I can show you using the inflate brush. Let me go through, find that thing, inflate, and I know I just missed it. Voila. From a back view, and this is just because I already know, the curvature here is quite straight when the semi-tendinosis comes in. You don't need to know that word, just the back is a little straighter because of the hamstrings. So I like to come in here and this is where I'll do a lot of the inflating. Smooth, sensitively inflate. Pull in a little bit for the calf muscle there, starting to really stretch those polygons. over to the move brush. Okay, there you go. So I'm doing this kind of quickly and a lot of this is some, there's some subtly developed structural knowledge in there. I've got this arch coming from the inside, the tibia coming down to the line. Um, I, need, I should get some more of the you know, more of the form in there, but this is good enough for now, and it's really kind of about all it's going to hold. I'm going to try for a second just to get more on the inside. Okay, yeah. Then I'm going to come around here and see if I can get some of this back. Okay. And inflate. Okay, there you go. So we've got ourselves a mannequin. The pelvis has dropped a bit, but could also be the package. So, you know, I hate to bring up an indelicate term, um, but you got to keep that triangle area in there for the package. If you don't sculpt the package, as one of my teachers said, um, you know, you might as well not even sculpt anything. You sculpt that area. You you're going to miss the form. Like you put pants on, and then suddenly people will be looking like, "What's wrong with that? What? Why do I keep looking at the crotch area?" Uh, and it's because you you didn't sculpt any package for for our guy. And you know, got to have a package. It's part of the deal. Isn't there some study that talks about? The first thing men and women look at in men and women, and there were some surprising revelations of what men were looking at, the package. All right, I'm putting in shoulder blades here. I'm putting in shoulders that 
basically it's the shoulder blade that coalesces with the deltoid muscle and keep in mind that they rib cage is here so these guys will tilt along the axes of the rib cage so they're coming down this way you want to be mindful of a couple of things so let me go through them right now mindful of where that spine is that spine goes further out in the stomach than you think okay uh, have you ever seen uh, people sculpt hunchbacks Okay, a lot of people, where, where does a hunchback bend? Where is, the, where is the hunch coming from? Is it coming in the neck? Is it just that the neck itself is, so he's got, they've got a normal spine and then suddenly the head comes down like that? Is it coming in the shoulders? So a normal spine and then the shoulders are just really crestfallen forward. If we're talking serious, serious, um, and it's an actual condition, I don't know the medical term, but if we're talking about serious hunchback condition, you're actually talking about that rib cage and the spine. So the spine is starting to bend so much that basically the thoracic one, normally the thoracic vertebrae would be nice and Let's do it in uh, green so it doesn't show very much. You know, you'd have this kind of nice angularity of the ribs. But now suddenly you've got this moving forward, but you've, you've got still the, the, ninth and, the ninth ribs coming down, the eighth rib, the seventh rib. All of these guys are still doing their thing, but now suddenly that first rib and that second rib and the third rib and the fourth rib, they're all just compressing in on each other. Thanks for the uh, for the full condition, Ellen. And uh, and so your spine changes, but a lot of other things change as well. And of course, the shoulders then start to droop, kind of forward. But it's not the shoulders; it's not the neck; it's the spine. And the spine is then adjusting the rib cage. Okay, let me check in, guys. How's my audio? I'm getting some notes. Ramiro, Steve, John says it's good. Sounds great. Okay. Oh, we're 50-50 now. Okay. Just keep me posted if there's sound problems. And also, uh, if you have sound problems, um, you can always go uh, to speedtest.net. And if you're streaming music, uh, it's just a bandwidth hog. We actually have to turn everything off when we do these classes because it just sucks it dry. Okay. So, yeah, as, um, as Matthew's saying, I'm sure you're all sitting a little bit straighter now. So uh, what I, I wanted to tell you that as a precursor because now I'm going to talk about where that shoulder is. So when we're talking about the shoulder, I want you to think about the rib cage as kind of a block. The shoulder in a military pose is going to be in the back half of that block. So there's going to be some considerable space between the shoulder and that massive muscular chest we're going to give him. Now again on a, on a personal note um, and by way of saying we all sculpt what we know. <laughs> Uh, it was years ago, I had this problem where I kept sculpting guys, and you can kind of see it here with a, with a chest and then the stomach kind of comes out. And I had this really hard time sculpting really masculine chests. And then, of course, you know, I, I turn 40, I go into the doc to have him check out my heart because, you know, the business is stressful and all of that stuff. And he says, oh, Ryan, by the way, you have a sunken chest. You know, it's not as bad as the stuff you see online, but it's a little sunken chest, and it causes a, a little heart uh, condition. It's totally minor, totally uh, insignificant. And um, 
just raises health insurance premiums by like 30 cents. It's ridiculous. But uh, all that time, I'm sculpting, you know, this subconscious sense of who I am <laughs> and not, you know, not what I'm trying to sculpt. So keep that in mind because that's a frustrating place to be where you just keep sculpting something and it doesn't look right, doesn't look right, doesn't look right. And you have to really dig in, really dig in to see, you know, where's your misunderstanding. So I'm going to fix all that stuff right now. I'm going to move the shoulder back and I'm going to unsink his chest. So shoulder back. Okay, and I control click and drag, but now I'm going to go into the move brush. I'm going to show you a trick. I'm just going to press control and click on these different pieces. And if you press control and you click, then it masks everything but them out. And you can just switch back to move. And we can give him a little bit more of a chest. Move, control, click, draw. Move, control, click, draw. Okay, move, control, click. And it looks like I've got to mask that out too. Drag that out and shift and move forward. It's crazy the way our brains work. Okay, I'm going to move this out to almost the two head mark. And I'm going to start to create this kind of shield, which will eventually become his trapezius muscles. And I just like to get him focused like that. And flatten it out a little bit. Okay, so we've got something here. We are missing the pecs. Okay, now the pecs would, of course, add quite a bit of volume if we wanted them to. But we don't necessarily need them right now. The pecs can be very distracting. I've seen this, uh, I saw this at Richard McDonald's. Uh, the breasts don't get sculpted until like, you know, the last five minutes. Get the rib cage in. You get the rib cage in, you get everything. You don't get the rib cage in, you don't get everything. Okay. Now, how do we put the arms in? I don't want to use the same approach I use with the legs. I want to use something else. Let me check in. Yeah, John has it. Tubes. Uh, Roberto. Uh, that last part was kind of confusing. Uh, ask your question and then we'll get you in chat. Yeah. So why use, we could use a sphere, but let's go into clay or curved tubes. Make sure it's curved tubes and not curved snap. Draw at your curve. But be mindful, it's going to take your draw size. Which could be cool, but could not. It's up to you what you want to do. I'm going to take stroke. I'm going to throw it over the side. And I want to show you just a couple of things about stroke or about this curve feature. Okay, One of them, you can draw these things as a line. And then this way, you just drag out and you go from point A to point B, and then it'll snap accordingly. If you don't have it as line on, then you can do all kinds of crazy things. Okay, You can also... Let's see, where did it go? Do I want to do it that way? Let's try bend. That's really for when you're adjusting things. Curve step. That's not going to show you guys too much. You can see the kind of control points that get drawn out. And if I increase that, then the control points become very difficult. If I decrease that, 
then the control points become, you know, you get a lot of curvature. Even two is too much. So let's go 0.5 or 0.25. Yeah, 0.5, we'll leave it. Okay, but you can also have this thing kind of adjust size along the dimensions here. So right now it's all pretty much one uniform size. But now let's go in. Well, let's see, curve functions. Now let's leave it. Let's go in here to curve fall off. Right now, curve fall off is set to intensity. But let's set curve fall off to size. So at the end of the curve, we get one size. And at the beginning, we get a smaller size. So you can track that by saying this is the start and this is the end. Okay? And let's invert that to test. I'm just going to click on these points, drag them up and down, drag them up. If you accidentally click and put one in, just drag it out. All right, so that worked. We inverted it just by changing that graph. So there's some usefulness here. You know, if you're doing ten tentacles and you want like some guy with crazy stuff going out of, all over him, then this is really very useful. We can mess with this in a couple of other ways. And now you're getting into like plant life and all kinds of different things. You know, there's a lot that we can do with the form here at this point. Looking in the questions right now. TL is great. Okay, cool. In our particular case, I'm just going to reset. It's not a huge advantage, but we could just trim it down a little bit. Because you know the beginnings, everything is just going to get smaller. That's just the way that goes. And if we want, we can make things a little simpler by just going line. And we're going to click up here where the humerus is. And we're going to drag down roughly to that pubic symphysis. Cool. OK, now can we move these points? Yes. You can move all of this stuff. If you turn that bend off, it won't move them individually. It just moves it as a block. All right. So now the arm has a gesture. You have the humerus, which comes and swings around. Then you've got the tibia and fibula. And then you've got the arm. Or, sorry, not the arm, but the hand. So you've got a boom, boom, and boom. That's the exaggeration. We're in Los Angeles. You can see this in Glen Keane and a lot of these guys. Glen Vilpu, you see them teach this stuff. It's not, uh, it's all there. But now there's one thing about curved tubes that's really important. It still has that stroke hanging out. It has that curve. Da, 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 da. So if I use a curve again, sometimes there's problems, some, you know, sometimes not. But I just prefer to go into functions and delete that curve. So I don't have to deal with it. Okay. Now I'm in move brush. Let's get the gestures. I'm going to make my draw size large. And I'm going to try to get a curve like that with one stroke. So I envision my the circle, something like that, and then the center of that circle. So I'm going to try it here and move forward. So it's just trying to economize. OK, my circle's too large. All right, there we go. A little bit of adjustment. OK, and of course. From a front view, it's more like this. It's in, out, and down. OK, we're going to check measurements in a real serious hardcore way here in a moment. Far from one stroke, but I tried. And I'll pull that down. Might as well get the hands in there.
Okay. We've got a basic generic body in there. I've walked you guys through a lot of the proportions. Um, my next level is to start to add a little bit more specific detail. But I want to show you something first, and it relates to, it's a technical thing. So let me show you how you get very specific measurements inside of ZBrush. Before we were eyeballing it, and uh, now what we want to do is, um, is get a specific measurement. So I'm going to go into the Move Brush, and I don't know if you can see this, but already up at the very top it has this thing that says 1.2745 units. That is a, it's 1.2745 ZBrush units is, is currently the, what it's taking, I think. I'm going to show you why that's not a, a given in a moment. But this measurement is reflecting, well, let's just test it. Look at this from a side view. I'm going to go from the top, and then I'm going to drag that back down. So that's looking at 1.29. So our grid is showing one head unit, but that head unit is showing up as 1.29 transpose units. So now we've got to get these guys lined up so that they're they're both saying the exact same thing. The visual grid is saying what this is saying. Not too hard to do. You just got to go into the preference, and let's throw this off to the side. And you're going to go into transpose units, and you'll see two things. You'll see unit scale factor. Okay. Right now the unit scale factor is one. So this means that it should be reflecting one ZBrush unit which the model's been scaled down into. Okay, and if you're wondering why is this showing one, and this guy's using 1.29, you can also think about or look into the fact that, let's see, size, it's not size, it's in our export. This thing is actually scaled. So there's some differences here. Okay, but what I want you to be thinking about more than anything else is just a very simple how do I get one head, one grid unit to be one transpose unit? Well, all you got to do is you, you make that measurement. You just set this transpose line out. And then you come in here to the calibration distance and you just say type in one. That's it. If you type that one into one, these guys are hooked up to each other calibration and unit scale. You change one, it changes the other. So this one's really easy to change because I know that I want this transpose line to now be one unit of measurement. If I was, for example, not measuring the, the head anymore, but I was measuring the body, I could go in and say, well, drag that out, and I want that transpose line to equal one measurement unit. And then I would be able to go in and say, well, you know, this is, come on there. That line did not want to behave. This is a 1.25, the entire height of the body. So from here, to here is 1.3, well, 0 0.1309, the uh, unit, in this case, the body. Remember, a head measurement that we use for classical sculpting is, it's, it's arbitrary, but it's awesome. Arbitrarily awesome. So I'm going to set that up. Set that up. I'm going to set that back to one. There you go. I have one minor ZBrush unit. You can also see, excuse me, pulling my chair over here. We've got minor and major ticks. We can take this number down. So you can set that to three, and what do you see? Oh my, we instantly have one third, right? That's kind of cool. Take it down to two or two, and you instantly have halves. 
So that can be really useful. You can set it to four, and then you'll have four, which could be distracting, but I, I like four. So I'm setting this to one head unit according to the grid, and I'm setting the minor ticks to four. Could we shake that up a little? Could we do two major ticks? So this way we get a, a really distinctive halfway point? Well, sure. OK. So let's go back into move. That chin, obviously not the right size. There you go. All right, so now what I do is check a couple of measurements. So I go into move, and I'm going to check the humerus. And uh, the humerus is, they say the humerus is 1.5 heads, but it's really actually from the acromion process. And if you want to know what the acromion process is, just put your hand on your shoulder. Okay, And that bony thing on the outside, basically right here, that bony thing that you can feel come back into this area, this guy right here, I'm outlining in red. This is the acromion process, the end of that. This is the spine of the scapula. We want the end point. And we're going to measure down to get 1.5. Do, do, do. 1.53, so yeah, and then I'm going to measure out 1.25, yeah, so we have an elbow here, we're going to have that, and then the hand is going to be down there, so we're within the range of reality. I think everything is in okay shape. Let's go into draw mode. Now I can do things like, let's go into move, or into the insert sphere. I'm going to draw out two dots here. And what these dots are going to become are the lats. Because you can see the lats from the front in some people. But as you can tell, they look more like tumors right now. So we need to shrink them down. Anybody remember? or know how I can take this perfectly spherical surface and then convert it into a flat surface. What's going to be my trick for that? You can use move, yeah. Transpose, trim dynamic. In this case, use transpose and move. Not the brush, but the transpose move. So we go into there. It's already kind of naturally hooked up, which is awesome. And then we're going to just press shift and drag. Let me look at it from this view. There you go. Flat, thin surface. Pretty simple, and it's all so easily set up for you. A little anatomy. When you look at the anatomy books, the latissimus dorsi is this big, huge muscle which comes all the way down and it's wrapping all the way along the back, right? And it comes all the way down to the butt. The only significant portion of the uh, latissimus dorsi, from our perspective, is going to be coming straight underneath this shoulder. So you take a curved line from the bottom of the shoulder and you move outwards. like that. So we're just going to cover this and move outward. The rest of this is just ex uh, erector spinea muscles that come in there. Right? Then of course there's the rib cage. Rib cage is huge. Um, and there's other stuff, but so I'm going to adjust this accordingly and kind of bury it a bit. But it's good to also nod to the, the ultimate form that it'll have. And anybody know where the latissimus dorsi inserts? Shoo, it's a crazy muscle. It inserts into the front. 
is a humerus. So this inside of the the armpit, man, that is just the coolest place to go and try to figure all this stuff out. I had to hide everything, so I pressed Control Shift and I clicked. That's just part of the process. It gets too extensive. Okay, I'm going to move that back. Cool. All right, I'm going to stop that guy right there. We could put pecs in the exact same way. In fact, I say I'm going to stop, and I might as well. So I'm going to pull them in and make them larger. Move, flat, draw. Remember your nipple line, two heads. Your nipples are here, okay? So that means that your breasts are not going to your breasts and your chest are not going to go that much lower. So move, we're going to drag that up and in. Up and back. Cool. Now it gets harder to move these guys. So you have to use a smaller brush to start to bring them together. A larger brush will just start it'll start to eat itself. Okay, that's enough of that. Ultimately, of course, some little piece of this pulls off down here. But we can save that for another day. All right, what do you think? Now we are at an hour and a half. We walked through insert mesh. We walked through a mannequin process, proportions, curved tubes. We do have more work to do. We're at, like I said, uh, we're at two hours now. Uh, Roberto, I did activate symmetry, yes. Will this be dynameshed afterwards, or would you somehow keep the insert pads as subtools? This would be dynameshed. Thanks, Fred. Okay. Okay, Riley, um, that adds my insert new insert mesh sphere to an existing polygroup rather than their own. Yeah, Riley, that happened to me too. Uh, it's part of the process. Like for example, let's turn polyframe on, and you can see, you know, the colors don't always indicate it, but if we do that trick of move, control, click, they're not all separated out. Like the head and the pelvis are the same. The stomach and these guys, they're the same. You can't change that. Um, we, it's just part of the process. Uh, Scott Dynamesh does preserve polygroups. And uh, Gilang, Gilang, am I saying that correct? Uh, the legs were done with a sphere and pulled down using snake hook. Gi, I'll do that. Uh, so I did the legs differently than the arm to really show you both different ways. Okay, so I have a little bit of time, and I know I've gone quite anatomy heavy, 
and um, and all that stuff. Uh, it, the latest ZBrush, by the way, handles uh, the DynaMesh keeps the polygroups, not the older versions. So if you're using the older versions, you'll lose uh, the polygroups. Okay, um, so I want to go through a little bit of uh, what we can do with this model. In fact, let me just block out what we're going to do next, guys. So I want to go into some mechanical stuff. I want to go into groups, talk to you about groups and how they work. Okay, and we're going to uh, create them and you know all of that stuff. I want to make sure you know selections. And this is really control plus shift click. Then we need to get it. I need to show you a quick DynaMesh. You know what that's all about. And then I want to get into another example. Sculpt. Okay, so now I want to, instead of going detailed like I did here, now the next thing I would like to do is spend about 20 minutes and just really get in and see if I can create a pose or some kind of uh, figure that really works for me. And I think what we'll do with this is actually we're going to use, um, I don't know, we'll use mannequins or we'll use this quick sketch. Okay. Whoops. Sorry, dropped the headset. Okay, so let's. We're going to get technical now. So just relax. We're going to get back into some sculpting here in a moment. But I want to make sure that you know about groups. So I'm in the tool palette. I open up poly groups, and I'm going to go in the side, and I'm going to press poly frame. So this is where we create groups. And groups you activate by pressing Control Shift and clicking. So there's two things, and for those who already know ZBrush, you're going to breeze through this, but if you want to isolate the pelvis, you press and hold Control Shift, click the model, or click the pelvis, and then let go of Control and Shift. If you want to select that shoulder, Control Shift, click, and then let go. Of course, we have the problem where we have one, two, three, four, five, all the same uh, part. So, so how do we separate these? Well, one way you can do it is you auto group. And so now everything is separate. But the problem is the left and the right side are separate as well. So then they have some tools here like merge similar groups. Okay, we can try that. But they're all kind of the same group. <laughs> so that didn't really work out in our favor, so auto group. And uh, no merge stray, so no group here. So what we have to do now is manually reset the groups. Because you want them. You don't want to control shift, sculpt this, and then have to slide over to the other side, control shift, slide that, sculpt that. What we want to do is press control shift, click on it. Then you want to control, click, and drag to invert. Then you want to control, shift, click. And then control, shift, click, and drag. So again, I'm going to write this down. You control, and let's just call this control plus shift. Let's just call this CS. And uh, well, it's really CSC plus click. So you uh, CSC, if I can spell it, <laughs> on one. Okay, then you CSC outside and you create a rectangle and that inverts it and then you CSC on that guy. And then you CSC outside. So four step, one, two, three, and four. Thank you. Uh, and so now that we've done that, we come over here and we say group visible. So group visible. Control shift, click, control shift, click and drag. Control shift, click. Control shift, click and drag. Group visible. 
control shift, control shift, click and drag, control shift, control shift, click and drag, group visible, control shift, click. Boom, 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 boom. Done. Okay, they're all separated out now. Okay, I can turn polyframe off. If you didn't get that, if you, if you struggled with it, don't worry. It's totally normal to struggle with that. Um, just go through the recording, spend a little bit of time, control shift, click, you know, control shift, click and drag, and yada, yada, yada. Um, I swear, it's muscle memory. You know, it's, it's one of those things where if you're having trouble, you just military drill yourself 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and 20 minutes of your life and you're done with it. You know, you won't forget it. Okay. So now, we have a basic shape here. And if we want to take this further, then we can simply go into Dynamesh and we can start to sculpt this because you can't really sculpt all of these separate pieces. There are a lot of problems and if you have any doubts about that, just try it. You'll see. You can get kind of far, but you run into problems, no doubt. So what I'm going to do is go into Dynamesh. So I'm in Tool, Geometry, Dynamesh, and I'm going to turn Project on, and I'm going to lower that resolution to 64 and just say Dash. Turn Polyframe on. Kept my groups. That last thing I did probably took a little bit of time to upload. So I'll wait a second. And, uh, and then there you go, it created the geometry. It's quite dense though for this body. So I might like to set this to 32 and try to dynamesh that again. Okay, but it didn't change. Let me turn polyframe off. Stop for one second, the system's complaining. You have to make some adjustment. You have to move a vertice, just the tiniest bit. If you move a vertice, then you can control, click and drag, and it'll dynamesh it again. If you do not, then it will not change it. You, ha you won't dynamesh it a second time. So this is a decent resolution level. This will kind of work for me. turn polyframe off, that's going to be a problem. But one thing to keep in mind, Dynamesh, the way Dynamesh works, and you'll really, you'll get this explained in the lecture, so I highly recommend that you do that because you also learn the history of it. But what's really significant here is, is it just a quick understanding of what Dynamesh is. Okay, I gotta stop because I, I know that's gonna take a moment to, to upload. Let me I'm just gonna pause for one moment. Have a drink of chai. And um and now I'll start to explain it. What is Dynamesh? T Laws has it right. It's unified skin. Uh, but in a in if you had to explain this to somebody, what would you say Dynamesh is? You know, something that explains how it works. Any thoughts? How would you describe what just happened? So we can, I can show you. So there. So how do we go from this kind of topology to this? What's happening here? Yeah, Mark has it right. Uh, it's, instead of a net, though, it's really, uh, you know, networks. What we're really doing is we're just projecting a grid. And you're just projecting that in space. 
from all angles. You know, it's not just that, uh, not just the front, it's also the side. So you can see from a side view, do you see where these triangles are? And you see how this, this topology line tries, like the devil, to stay straight up and down. Where these triangles are really represents where this diagonal line is, is kind of pulling out. It needs another slice of topology, another slice, another slice, another slice, another slice. And so it just keeps needing these slices of topology going out in this direction. From the front, we're pretty okay. You know, you can see, let's see if we look at it from a side view. Let's look at it kind of from here. You can see, right, we've got a pretty even grid, but then it has to kind of slice, it changes, and a slice, and it changes. And you can see that slice propagate down. And you see it propagate down in these different places. These are all, you can almost imagine them as step ladders. This is when they just kind of ladder through. You know, they just need another kind of slice of it. And I can show you guys this really, um, really simply. Let me come down here. I think, is it still here? Yeah, it's still here. So I'm in the tool palette geometry, and there is this thing called unified skin. And uh, it, I'm going to just kind of, I'm going to set this really, well, let's, let's leave it at 128. And I'm going to say make unified skin right now. Now, it hasn't changed this model because this, this worked the old way. So what it did is it created a model here, a separate model in the tool palette that you had to select. Excuse me, and you can kind of see it's doing something similar. You know, it's got, let's say it steps down, okay, and then it steps down, and you can see that stepping down, boom, boom, all of that. Anywhere you see a triangle, that's where it's kind of stepping down or taking another slice. Let's look at that from the side view. Same thing, see? Slice, slice, slice. And all kinds of math was tried. And, and I don't know, I mean, this is, this is not a terribly complicated math, but it is pretty complicated stuff, you know, to have a grid projecting through space and still represent a volume. It is complicated, but let me show you the simple math of it. But, no, not the simple, but the, let me show you the bare bones of it. I'm going to set smooth down to zero and say make unified. Okay, and so this is, with smooth at zero, that's the first thing the algorithm does. Do you see how it looks like Legos? Very pixelated. Let me smooth this out now. Does that topology look familiar? That's a unified skin topology. It's very similar to Dynamesh topology. They did in Dynamesh they changed it from these diamonds to a to a triangle, so they could continue that line down without adding anything. So they got rid of the diamonds because diamonds are very very painful to sculpt. So it creates this Lego version, that's all it does, it just assembles Legos that look like the volume of it, and then it smooths it down. But then it also inflates it back to represent your volume. So it smooths it, and that smooth is a smart smooth, it actually inflates as well. That's been in ZBrush for eight plus years. It's been in ZBrush for a crazy long time. Dynamesh is just simply a much more intelligent, more advanced version of Unified, but you can tell it does the same thing. Internally, it builds that Lego. 
And instead of those diamonds, it creates neat triangles, which we can handle that math. And you can move those around a little bit, like it moves form around a little bit to help it compensate and adjust. But it's a crazy advanced algorithm. It's huge advancement, no doubt. Huge, huge, huge advancement. And then, of course, the next huge advancement came around, Z remesher. You know, what the heck is happening with this thing? Okay, so we had Dynamesh, and now I just went to Z remesher. And what? Now I've got edge flow. These legs are separated out. That head's looking nice. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff coming down the pike uh, for it. But what we want to worry about is Dynamesh. So where am I at time-wise now? Uh, 542, okay. Alrighty. So we've got this, this Dynamesh. And um, where were we going to go with this? I wanted to get into subtool. We wanted to get into this guy. But now basically it's sculptable, I guess. And now we just turn polyframe off. We have symmetry on. We go into our clay buildup. And you start to do stuff. You know, in this case, I'm going to put a rib cage in. But I think what I'm going to do with my... Uh, practice with my other session. Don't forget the package if you sculpt anatomy. What would you guys like to see sculpted? That's not human anatomy. I'm going to look at the questions. I'm just going to sculpt a little bit. Whoa. Okay, let me take a look. Caveman, keep going. Horse, satyr, car. Whoa, car is pretty intense. Insect, props, anything hard surface. Insectoid, werewolf. Let's do some insects, I think. Chains and micro mesh. All right, so I've sculpted a uh, a di I've sculpted a, a human to an extent. I think I've destroyed the human. So let me go back <laughs> to before I willy nilly started to sculpt <laughs> carelessly on my creation. Uh, don't sculpt while under the influence of of teaching. Uh, so I've done this. Now we need to. I want to give you guys another example. So either I create some kind of other pose, uh, or we get into some other types of um, uh, sculpting options. So let me go and do this. I'm going to go into Lightbox Tool. I'm going to bring in a polysphere and close Lightbox. And uh, now I'm not going to worry about proportions and all of that. I'm going to put the floor down at the bottom. I'm going to use the Move Brush. I'm going to go really quick. Symmetry is on right now. Okay, I'm gonna put a let's make sure we delete. I'm gonna put a pelvis in there. So I'm, I am doing human at this point. And let's turn symmetry off. Where do we go? There we go. Symmetry is on. Draw size is too big. Okay. Move brush. Mm, not sure this is what I'm going to want to do because we have to get into more human stuff here. How do we pose? What are the three parts of it? 
I almost prefer to do that later since we've gone through so many technical things. My goal right now, I'm just, I'm talking aloud, guys. This is what I do with myself in the, I'm just trying to figure out what's the single most important thing that I give you guys. If I sculpt the figure, I'm kind of doing that a little bit for myself, but I need something that you can achieve. What would be, too much chai is right, Bear Ruse, I just had some. What would be the next thing for me? So something that's not, because humans have so much associated with them. I'm going insect, woolly mammoth, or dinosaur. Could do a weapon. Weapons are really fast. Dinosaur, old tree, that's a really good one. I like that idea. The idea would be to work with something that's going to use this insert sphere and give us some sub-tools so we get prepared for that next little bit. And we do some cool sculpting. Anybody here studied insect anatomy? I wrote, I did a course on it once, but it was a while ago. I'm one of those guys, they have to, they have to study the form of things before they can do things willy-nilly. So, let's do insect. And um, let's put in the thorax. Okay. Okay, move brush. Okay, but now I'm going to go into my brush curve. I'm going to turn AccuCurve on because that's really important for creating kind of these interesting shapes. All right, like I just put a head in there somehow. And let's see, put some eyes in there. And let's go into curve tube. Let's go into stroke. We need to set this curve back so it's not as line and bend is there. And I'm going to want more curve steps. Let's see if I can pull that in a little. There we go. Back into insert sphere. How do these guys connect? BSH for snake hook. And I'm just going to use snake hook to create some kind of crazy shape in here. Hey, Ryan. Yeah? We've got a few questions uh, about AccuCurve. So if you want. They're asking, like, what does AccuCurve do exactly? Uh, everybody, meet Lewis. Lewis, meet everybody. Hi, guys. Uh, <laughs> AccuCurve. Oh, what's wrong with that neck? It's horrible. Okay, uh, AccuCurve is simply another way for um, the brush to read this curve. And really, what it's doing, if you look at this, you see that curve right there, right? Um, that curve is a graphical representation of some mathematical operation. As such, it's a bit of an approximation. And you can really discover that with uh, Z-intensity. When you put Z-intensity down to a really low level, there, um, the mathematical, uh, how do I say it? The mathematical truth of an, equ of an equation does not always correlate to what we as humans would expect. So for example, 50% gray from, for our eyes, as human, our human eyes, it, we don't read that as a mid-tone gray per se. So Photoshop, for example, will automatically adjust the gray level of an image to kind of compensate and start to make it a little bit more perceptually 
honest, which means not mathematically honest. So there is some approximation that happens within ZBrush in the, in the internal system, and uh, and that is reflected in this Accu curve. So um, with Accu curve off, then ZBrush is going to try to make this curve fit what it thinks a human would expect from it. So there's an extra little bit to the algorithm that says, you know, um, add this much down towards the bottom, you know, take away this much towards the top, just to kind of even out what people's expectations are. If AccuCurve is on, then it uses an older version of this, uh, which is just a little bit more, I mean, we can hover over that. But it's a little different, so. Da, 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 da. Uh, ZBrush may use internally a slightly modified version of the edit curve. If you believe that's not really working for you, then just turn AccuCurve on and it forces ZBrush to behave a little bit more accurately, so it speaks. So to speak. Okay, so we have a thorax. And you are welcome for the explanation. And let's put a sphere in there. And I'm going to move that head. So I'm going to go move, control click, and then control alt, unpaint, undo that, and then control and do that. Control click and drag. I'm going to make that body a little, a little smaller. But as I'm doing that, it's starting to give it some character which is really kind of nice. And that character starts to automatically assume some sort of insectoid quality. I'm just using the move brush here. Okay, just the move brush, just pushing and pulling. And they have all these crazy shapes coming out down here. I'm going to delete the curve that's there. It's starting to mess with us. Whoa, there you go. It's starting to get crazy. Insert sphere. Let's put a little tiny bit of something there. And then there we go. Move brush. Let's put that body in there. How's this working out for you guys? Is this uh, is this a, a good way for us to go? I feel comfortable with it, but just want to check. Okay, what do I want to do there? Let's change that up a bit. There. Just giving it a little bit more. And let's give that some... Okay, lowering the draw size and dragging, and then kind of pushing and pulling around there. Okay.
Control Shift click, and this way this one's this guy's isolated. I'm gonna adjust his contour slightly. And let's move this down so that it all kind of fits in one streamline. Okay, how many legs do we want? One, two, three. So we've got two on the body in this area. And I'm pressing Alt right now. And then we've got one right there. And I'm going to really pull these guys in. And there we go. And of course, now we come in with curved tubes and, and uh, let's do the back. And we have to do what? One, two, three, four, five sections. So the flow is going to be along and then it kind of doubles back and then out, I think. Okay. Uh, all right, stroke, delete, and then let me look at this from a top view because that's the anatomy I'm looking at. Back into the move brush, I'm going to pull back. Mm-hmm. And bow that stuff out. Okay, I'm not going to take too much more of your time. We've got one portion. I'm going to go into the inflate and start to create the separations. And you can also negatively inflate. And then I go into the insert brush. I can pull that guy out. And with snake hook, I can do something kind of crazy. I'm going to use transpose to just flatten that a little from all these angles. and then back into the move brush. And we can pull out little doohickeys. Cool. So I know lots of stuff missing and I don't feel at all comfortable with some of this anatomy. I completely lost some of that language. Uh, but we're not doing too shabby. I'm going to smooth out one side and then use that move brush to just have one side dominate. Now, I could show you a trick, but I'm going to stop one second uh, because I am, uh, I've lost track. I don't know where you guys are.
and look, read through the questions. Uh, John, what version of ZBrush are you using? That'll determine. You have to be using the newest ZBrush to get the um, DynaMesh to keep the groups. And uh, Mark, you're asking about reference. Yeah, uh, so reference goes a little bit more into um, portraits and stuff of that nature. So check out the lectures, and they go through reference there. I don't, um, reference is not essential for the project that you create today. Uh, what is essential is that we start to get a little bit more uh, involved in your sculpting. Okay. All right, guys, I need to show you one more thing. Okay. Still, let me see. What's a wasp? Ah, there we go. I see it. Um, we need to change the angle of these guys. So I'm going to control shift, click, control shift, click, control shift, control shift, and invert. Okay, and I'm going to rotate these guys. So it's a little bit more there. There we go. Back into draw. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to isolate just this leg, and there are some things I need to do. I need to move it, but I need accu curve off. I need to change it so from a side view, I'm, I'm going to be able to get that kind of view. And maybe we do this. We rotate, we isolate, rotate. Rotate, mask it, and since there are insects, we can kind of get away with a lot with this form. To the point of even using the center dial to just kind of rotate that around, and then use move to pull it back in. I don't like that last little bit. Okay. Now what we want to do is duplicate these. So I'm going to hide it, mask the body, control shift click and show just that leg. And what we want to do now is like I said, we need to duplicate the legs. So we can do it two ways. I'm going to do it a couple ways. I think we go move, drag out our action line and press shift and then you just press and hold control and move that on up. Actually, I think this is the only way we're going to do it. I think this is best. So control and that middle dot while you're in move. And it will duplicate the non-masked portion. Okay, look into the questions here. All right, I'll get back to that. Let me control copy this other guy. There you go. And now this one I'm going to rotate. So that he's more coming from a front perspective. And uh, he's probably going to need a little bit of adjustment with move just to get things kind of lined up correctly. I want to move it so it's not in the way of his head. And then let's select that. I'm trying to isolate one leg, the middle set of legs. Not very easy. Right? So let me show you one more trick. Move, control, click on one, and move to the other. So I pressed control, I clicked on one part, and I moved to the other part. And then that masked the other piece. That masked everything but what I was clicking on. Of course, I have to manually go in and deselect these guys, but that's okay. Let's move that out a little bit. Switch over to draw, and let's give that a slightly different 
countenance. There you go. And now that head needs some love. Okay, move, and I'm just going to pull those back. Move will almost never allow you to whip a form back. Notice how it's always kind of leaving a little piece. Even if I start up here at the tip, it is really hard. It always leaves something. So that's why you really want to get to know snake hook. Because that brush can work some miracles. Okay, so now there we go. We got something. I'm not going to say it's my best insect. And uh, he's quite spread out, but he's got, got a lot. Let's put perspective on. There, that'll make him look better. Now, I've got all these parts. You can check your, uh, your polygroups and see if you really like them. And if you do, then you just set your resolution, Dynamesh. And now you can get in and start to sculpt at a high resolution. So now in this case, I'll do things like, and I'm just going to show you real quick on the car piece here. You sculpt rough like I'm doing right now. And this might not make sense, like it starts to look organic. Not organic. I'm just trying to get some randomness in here. There we go. Okay. Sculpted. I'm going to show you one more brush. Let's go into B, P for polish and the polish brush. This brush can make short work. This, you use this when you're sculpting cars, a lot of things. It really starts to make things flow. But then don't forget H polish. So you press B and H. And this brush is a godsend. Try pressing Alt as well. But you can break this, you can unify it. That's what this is really for, is for unifying edges. Getting rid of that clay tubes look. It's all naturally freehand. And then you can come back in with clay buildup, but now you set your depth kind of low, like let's say two. And you set your stroke lazy mouse to 0 0.05. And you get to do a little bit more innovative stuff. Just kind of break it all up. See if you can kind of carve out a nice car piece or a shell or something of that nature in there. Okay, let me check in with you guys because we are running out of time. And as we said, these three-hour things can get intense. Okay. Um, Kurt, 
if you were to use zebra mesher, you lose all your poly groups. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Can you, should you attempt to recover them? Uh, you you want to recover polygroups for arms mostly, Kurt. And that's just so you can sculpt the under under part. Okay. Steve, snake hook functions. Um, snake hook uh, is really just what I what I just did. Um, I can explain it in thirty very fast. Uh, polyframe. It just takes geometry and tries to stretch it. So you see the long elongated pieces. It takes the geometry and tries to fit it within the your brush stroke. And then it has some filtering that happens and it does as much of the stroke as it can. And it's kind of a precursor to curved tubes. Think of it that way. Uh, Jose, difference between polish and age polish. Now I have started to introduce you to the brush system. I want you to take a look. Okay, now I do cover what the difference is in uh, in week three. Okay, we are going to deep dive into brushes, but I don't want to do that just yet. Uh, so, but I would challenge you. Tell me what the difference is between polish and age polish, and I'll tell you how I look at the difference. I simply take the brush, and I do this for every version of ZBrush. I go brush by brush, and I see what's different in all of these palettes. Every single version I do that. T-Laws, I think a mannequin, I want to work on a mannequin for you. Let me make a note of this. I'm afraid of throwing too much information at you guys because we have a lot. So T laws, I'd love to do mannequins, but I do not want you to become overloaded. Uh, we do have a workshop on that though, so that's actually probably the best thing for you is to look in your atelier bundle. There should be a creating. Um, there should be a mannequin. If not, let me know. I would be up for doing that. Uh, Kurt, what's better for clean grooves, Damien Standard or clay buildup? I would probably say Damien Standard brush. And that's another one. You'll see Peter Koenig use a brush like this. Louis, do you remember if, uh, if he uses that? I'm not sure if you saw that or not. Yeah, actually, uh, he also uses a crease brush quite a bit, cool. but it's very similar to the Damien Standard. I think it just has a smaller uh, alpha. Okay. Lots of shapes, lots of things you can do. Looking through questions? All right. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys two choices um, for homework. And again, homework is for you. You want to learn these tools and uh, go through these lectures. The certification process is a test. So this is really knowing about the features and the history, and uh, not the history, but uh, really the context. You really don't need to know ZBrush history in terms of how it provides context for you. Why are subtools there? Check out the lectures on that. We got I cover the whole thing, I explain it, and give you a really thorough topological explanation for it, and then and a really good dem uh, demonstration of, of how that relates to film, uh, res, and all that stuff. Um, but then, in terms of what you would be doing to this week and projects, uh, if you can, I would recommend creating a body. Okay, if you're anatomically minded. Uh, create the human body. If you are not anatomically minded and you find it frustrating, then do this insect or do a prop. C come on, Ryan. You can spell. We can do this. Insect. Yay. Uh, we're not, it's not terribly complicated. Uh, the main goal that I have for you right now is that you get comfortable sculpting. 
100% hands down, that's the single most important thing. You're going to learn these features, but ZBrush is not something where you just learn the features and that's it. You, know, you, you have to learn how to sculpt. So sculpt a body, sculpt an insect, sculpt a prop. Sculpt, give yourself a challenge to start to reach uh, an, another level beyond just the head sculpting. I want to really see how you create form, edges, how you think about um, uh, contour, silhouette, how you're, what tools you're using, and uh, how you're making the most out of the program for that. And use all the tools you want. It's totally fine. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Kurt. Therese, Riley. Mac, uh, Riley, don't worry about the, um, the Max versus Maya. Uh, it, I put it in that context because I know Maya. Um, so sorry about that if it caused your Max brain some confusion. But your Max brain is owned by one software company now. So, so hopefully we'll get like one, <laughs> one joke I can say. Uh, Rodrigo, what do you think of the RAM brush? Nobody asks me about the RAM brush anymore. Is it still there? No, it's in the it's in the light box and brush probably. Keep in mind you can get all these brushes here, guys. There's a ton of them. You can see a lot. Different slashes under light box and brush. Uh, what do I think? Oh, uh, what do you think with the RAM brush? I made the RAM brush, so I mean I like it, uh, but really it's uh, it's a very intense brush. At least I think I made the RAM brush. Could be wrong. And Fred, yeah, we'll start working with subtools next week. But they are explained in the lectures this week um, online. Rivia, thank you so much for staying up late. Mark, thank you for the man mammoth session. I love doing this. And uh, <laughs> you can feel the steam coming out of your seventh cervical vertebrae, I'm sure. All right, guys, this is recorded. We will upload it. We will have it up Tuesday because we are out of office um, Sunday, Monday. If you have any questions, uh, post them in the questions, though. I will be checking the, the platform. All right. Thanks, guys. Anybody want to save this chat? It would Now would be a great time to do that. Just let me know when you do, and then I know I can, I can cut this off. Eric, uh, stick with me one second. While I'm waiting for somebody, I can explain your problem. Uh, you guys, if you want to head on out, go ahead and head on out. You don't need to be here uh, for this. I'm just going to answer Eric's question, and that is, uh, I have a project in-house. How do I get an OBJ file from being invisible in the back? And uh, really what he's, uh, what he's encountering is that he's brought his model in, and it has, its normals are inverted. Is that, am I understanding that correctly, Eric? Okay, so the answer is as simple as coming here to Tool, Display, Display Properties, and just saying Flip. There are some complexities to that, uh, and I haven't tested this in a while, uh, so I'm not sure how, um, how strong that button is now. Make sure that you have saved and you, you are in a complete safe zone before you use that button uh, in the beginning stage. If you have resolution levels, it used to not behave properly. Now I think that's fixed. Uh, but if you import something into it, you know things can get a little problematic. Uh, so just you know be mindful. Flip is the tool that does it, and it, it's pretty robust now. But in uh, ZBrush three days. We had huge problems, huge problems. 
Okay, uh, Chris, um, homework is really the project, which is what, the way I want you to think about this. The project in terms of sculpting a body or an insect, just try to work on it this week, this coming up week, and just push your sculpting. Every week you want to be sculpting something, anything. Uh, Eric Mark also has a suggestion in there for you to check out Mesh Lab. Uh, but I do have to preface, um, anytime you bring Zebra, a model into ZBrush, remember the benevolent dictatorship? ZBrush will determine the normal of your model. So in Maya or Max or you know, XSI, you determine the normal of a polygon. It, that is irrelevant in ZBrush. It does not take that into consideration. It has an algorithm that evaluates you know, where most of the forms are facing in and if they're facing out. So it has this own algorithm that in some forms uh, does not work properly. And it will flip your normals. It just completely flips them, your world space. So you flip them back and you'll be in better shape. Okay, guys, you've saved the log. I don't need those. It's just save them for yourself if you, uh, if you want them. Thank you so much, guys. I really, really appreciate you being here with me on the weekend. Uh, we will get back to you on the uh, breakout session idea. You will still have a session on Thursday. It will most likely be through Hangouts, uh, in which case we will send you another URL. But you'll still have your Thursday session with Nate, but he's going to kind of open up to sessions more at, in the morning and a little bit later so that Europe uh, can be addressed and North America work hours can be addressed. All right. Have a good one. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great uh, if you're If you're of that ilk, uh, happy Diwali, and um, I'll see you guys next Saturday.